Hi everyone, I'm Inian. I'm a senior software engineer at Superbase and you can follow me on Twitter at everconfusedguy. Today I'm going to be talking about Superbase storage, how we built the product and how we balance different aspects of developer experience, performance and security while building the product. So what is Superbase? Superbase is an open source file-based alternative. When you sign up to Superbase, you get a full-fledged Postgres database and you get the necessary tools to build your own authentication uh, flows in your website or mobile apps. And uh, you of course get storage, which I'll be talking about today. And also uh, we'll be releasing Superbase functions soon, which is our own serverless platform. So Superbase storage is an object storage service anything that's too big to directly store in your database like images or videos or CSV files, it's better to store it in something like an object storage service. Uh, and that's what uh, we have built. Let me show you a quick demo of what uh, the dashboard to storage looks like. So this is the dashboard we uh, have built a way for you to easily explore different objects in your buckets. So you can create new buckets, you can explore existing buckets and we show rich previews of the different files in the different buckets and we have built the UX to be very similar to that of a file explorer. So even if you have not used an object storage service before, this should be pretty intuitive on what are the different capabilities that we provide. So uh, before we started building Superbase storage, we decided to list down what are the constraints that we had. And the primary thing that we looked at was how well an existing solution can integrate with the Superbase ecosystem. We wanted the storage service to integrate well with Postgres and also our existing auth solution that uh, we have built out for our users. The second thing that we looked at was to make sure that the service that we built or ended up using had a pretty small footprint. Superbase has a very generous free tier and we wanted to make sure that storage was one of the services that even users in the free tier could use and making sure it was small and efficient made sure that we could add Superbase storage as a feature to all our users. And of course, since multiple users are using Superbase for it to be efficient, we needed a multi-tenant solution and we decided that we are primarily going to be focused on digital native companies, which means that uh, as a company, we'll be focusing more on users who are using the hosted platform or even if they are self-hosting Superbase, they are going to be launching Superbase themselves in a cloud provider, which means that we could use managed services like S3 or Google Cloud Storage to actually store the different objects. So in the end, we decided to build our own server, I guess spoiler alert, but before that we evaluated a lot of open source uh, middlewares like Ceft, Swift, Minio and Zenko. But the main deal breaker was that none of these systems integrated natively with Postgres. We already launched a full-fledged Postgres database for our users and it made sense to use that as the data store instead of say uh, HCD which Minio requires in multi-user mode or MongoDB and Kafka which requires uh, which is required by Zenko for its full operation. And the other problem that we had with existing systems was that they came with their own auth systems. There is no elegant way to map Superbase uses users with say Minio users and we couldn't find a proper solution for this and it didn't feel nice to sort of throw the problem over to developers building on top of Superbase and expect them to figure it out as well. So we wanted to do something better over here. And there are a lot of features which are not directly relevant to our use case. For example, features like bit route protection and making sure that drives wouldn't fail and if a new drive is attached, how to make use of that new space uh, uh, to store your objects. All these features were not uh, relevant to us because we decided to go with a managed service like AWS S3 or Google Cloud Storage to actually store the different objects. 
and some of these solutions were also deal breakers because uh, we found out there were limits to which in terms of the number of buckets that you could create and so on and they weren't uh, aligned with the number of users we expected Superbase to have. So this is the final architecture that we came up with. It consists of three different layers. The storage front end is the dashboard that I showed you before and the different client libraries with which you can integrate with the API server. The API server itself has an API gateway Kong, which we use across our Superbase ecosystem. And the API server also talks to Postgres where we store our object metadata like where the object is stored, who uploaded it, at what time and so on. The object itself is stored in a managed service like S3 or Backblaze or Wasabi and so on. Even though we decided to build our own object storage service, we looked at prior work to see how we can better change the defaults to suit users building on top of Superbase. And one of the things that we realized is that having a max upload size of say 160 GB uh, of S3 didn't make sense for Superbase users. Most of them are building websites or mobile applications and having a 160 GB file is rarely what you need. So we decided to cap the upload size to uh, 50 MB. And another thing that we changed the default for uh, is the cache time. So any file that you upload to S3 by default does not have a cache time attached to it which leads to very poor performance if you're using it in your mobile apps and websites because the client has to revalidate with the S3 server every time uh, if the object has changed or not. For Superbase, you get a default cache time of one hour, which you can of course change uh, when you upload the object to a different time depending on your use case. This is an example where we try to balance performance and developer experience. When we started building Superbase storage, this is what the, a simplified version of the schema looked like. Uh, we had two tables, buckets and objects. Each of them had a UUID. And the objects table contains a foreign key to the buckets table. But we realized the most common access pattern did not really involve the UUID at all. It directly involves the name of the bucket and the object name. And this also leads to inefficient queries because every time someone accesses slash avatar slash grumpy.jpg, we need to join both of these tables to get the relevant row in the objects table. And we decided to just use the bucket name as the primary key for the buckets table and dropped the UUID com completely. This made it easier to write queries which just use the bucket name and it's faster because you can get the relevant row by just accessing the object table. We also had to balance security and developer experience. Uh, from prior experience, we realized that it was pretty easy to leave your S3 bucket open to the public. So in Superbase, buckets are not public by default. For each and every object that you want to expose publicly, you have to intentionally create a signed URL for that object. Uh, this makes it harder if you just want to host your website uh, on Superbase and if you want to make the entire pub bucket public. Uh, so at some point we might expose a way to make this easier, uh, to make the entire bucket public. But for now, you need to create signed URLs for uh, every object that you want to expose publicly. And this makes your intention very clear as to whether you want the object to be public or not. Another decision we had to make was to where to store the object metadata itself. So we could either store it in our own internal database, which we don't expose to the user, or we can store it in the Postgres database that we provision as part of every product project that the user launches. Um, we decided to do the latter because it gives full control of the data to the user. So even if the user wants to self-host Superbase or move to a different provider, he has full control of the data and also users can adapt the database to their own workloads by say adding a new index to the objects table uh, 
based on their existing workloads. This is something that as developers of Superbase, we can't predict what the workload would look like. So, uh, but the developers who build on top of Superbase might have a better understanding of this and might be able to fine tune the database to their needs. But this also comes with some challenges because users can tamper with the tables. For example, you can delete the entire objects table leading to incorrect behavior or upgrades. Uh, so the solution we decided was that we prevent showing or modifying these tables from the dashboard, but the developer can still connect to the database and run SQL. In that case, we assume that the developer knows what he's doing and can fine tune to the database to his needs. So we'll be talking a bit about how we built our authorization system for the rest of the presentation. So here, I, we already use a open source project called GoTru, which generates JSON web tokens for every user who successfully authenticates with the system. And the idea was to reuse this JWT for making calls to the storage API server as well. And this is how authorization policies look for other systems like Firebase or AWS S3. If you have written policies for these systems, these might look familiar. But the main thing that we wanted to do was to see if we can reuse an existing language like SQL and not build another DSL or domain specific language to write these policies in. This makes it faster for our users to get started because there's one less thing for them to learn. And the, before I get into how we achieve that, just give you a quick intro to Postgres row level security if you haven't used it before. So using row level security, you are able to attach policies to different tables. So for example, here I'm attaching a policy to the users table for uh, the select statement where users are only able to select rows which have the ID belonging to the current user. So for example, even if a user comes with an ID one and if he tries to do select start from users, only the first row is returned uh, because that row has the particular ID belonging to that user. And similarly, RLS policies can be added for other uh, CRUD statements like update, delete, and so on. And the main insight here was to that we could reuse these row level security policies and we, it can be mapped to the permissions required to make an API call. For example, if to find out if a user has permissions to upload a new object, we just see if the user has the permission to insert a new row in the objects table. And if he has that permission, we let him upload the object as well. And this can be mapped to other CRUD operations in a seamless way too. So this is an example of an actual policy that you can write on Superbase storage. This uh, policy applies to the objects table and it checks for, uh, for a particular file name called profile slash grumpy.jpg and it allows the user with UID one to uh, do all CRUD operations on that particular object. So the advantage of writing policies in this way is that it's just SQL you get the full power of SQL, all the internal functions, all the helper functions that we have built like file name, folder name, uh, extension, and so on. And also you get the helper functions in the auth schema like UID, email, uh, to make use of while writing your policies. And for users who do not have much experience with SQL before, we are also building a GUI into the dashboard so that it's easier to get started with these policies. There's another key piece of the solution which made it easier to build the authorization system this way, and that was Postgres. So Postgres is an API server which exposes a REST API on top of your Postgres database. And Postgres.js is uh, the client library which we built to interact with Postgres. And say if a user comes and he wants to list all images in the folder, the easy way to do this would be to just instantiate a new Postgres client as that user. And we already get the JWT token from the user 
and we can inst instantiate a Postgres client using that JWT. And this lets us assume the role of that user and any further database operations that we do would be done as part under the user's role. So this lets the storage API server switch roles between different users easily and carry out operations which solve the problem in an elegant way. We also wanted Superbase storage to integrate well with the rest of the storage ecosystem and we wanted to see what other storage backends developers wanted us to integrate with and we created a GitHub discussion for it. People responded everything from Google Cloud Storage to S3 to even IPFS and the way we solved this problem of integrating with different storage backends was that we decided to target the S3 API first. We realized that a lot of existing storage backends already target S3 and this makes it easier to add new storage backends in the future. And our existing API surface area also just consists of these six operations. So even if your, exist, your storage backend doesn't support the S3 API, as long as you're able to re-implement these six operations, it should be easy to expand support to that backend as well. Finally, I also wanted to talk about designing the client APIs. So this is what the Postgres API looks like when you want to read data from the table. And this is what our initial uh, API for the storage looked like. This had a few different problems. One was that it wasn't obvious that all op API operations have to be scoped to a particular bucket. And we realized that by changing the API to something like this, it's much more obvious that all API operations only happen at the bucket level. And it also matches the Postgres syntax loosely, which was an added advantage. So that's it. That concludes my talk. Uh, hopefully you got something from how we balanced developer experience, performance and security, and how we made it easier for developers to get started with Superbase storage. Uh, you can find me on Twitter at everconfusedguy, and you can find out more about Superbase at superbase.com. Thanks.